you are here. That's what a sign I saw at a mall said to me one day. <laughs> when you're lost, it's good to have that kind of direction. Gives you a sense of place, a sense of where you are in relation to other things. Well, today, you and I, yes, we, are here. We have come into this house, the songwriter says, and gathered in Christ's name to worship him. From different traditions and forms of expression, coming together in worship in this physical place, but more than that, seeking to find our existential and maybe even prophetic place here and now, in this moment and time, for such a time as this. Seeking to aim ent gain entry in a way that has meaning for the living of our days, but also seeking to understand things of the past, the memory of days gone by, the things that have come before us, and of people of a bygone day. In the life of Jesus, you heard Luke 4, a special time, special here moment for him. You see, Jesus entered into, yes, that physical place. He went home to Nazareth. But he also went to a physical place called the synagogue. That was his custom. It's not the custom of many individuals, you know, when they have the sense about being in a hometown. They may not go to church. But it was his custom to find his way into a synagogue in his hometown. And in that synagogue, at that moment, in that time, he read, he found these words from Isaiah 61. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. Sounds like an arrogant statement, but it isn't. Because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. Sounds like a self-assured statement, but it's not. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives. Could be considered ego-driven, but it's not and recovery of sight to the blind. It's not an eye doctor. To let the oppressed go free, it's not a judge or an attorney. To proclaim the year of God's favor for such a time as this. Here, in these words, he proclaimed to all who could hear that he was sent by God, not on his own anointing, not because he was all of that in a bag of chips, not because he somehow had arrived at a certain point in his own teaching, in his own living, but more because he was called by God anointed by God, transported, if you will, to that new and existential place, that new and prophetic place operating under the anointing of God, to be among folks who might not be considered by some people as important those who were poor, those who were captive, those who were blind, 
those who are oppressed and brokenhearted. You see, those kinds of people take up a lot of time. And for individuals who don't want to spend the time engaging with individuals like that, it might be considered a waste of time. But under the anointing that God had given to Jesus, he said, these are the folks, these are the folks that I think that God has called me to serve. And what a wonderful opportunity there is in serving those five types of people. Being in that prophetic and existential place was, yes, something that Jesus came to know something about, and he lived his life trying to extricate those individuals from the places where they were, and I'll say more about that, about the outcome about that in a minute. But it's the same place. It's a familiar place to Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. Even though he was exposed to violence and verbal abuse, he was exposed to discrimination and disrespect. He was exposed to wiretapping and a wound that almost took his life. In his words and in his actions, King said, we are here, right now, at this moment, assigned to a task, anointed and appointed by God, called by God to do what only he could do. And I want to suggest to you that each one of us, though we may be in a physical place, that there is also that same existential and prophetic place to which all of us are being called. It's about what life means. It's about what the meaning of your life is. It's about what it is that you are to do uniquely with the gifts and skills that each one of you has been gifted with. And I I'm sure I have absolutely positively no doubt that each and every individual has a unique gift, unique to them, to be used in the service of the Almighty to make the here better. So King said, we are here, but we should not. No, we dare not stay here because the here is not all that great, truth be told. Depends on the day, but the here is not great. We must move, he said, from here to where conditions are better, to where circumstances are better, to where discrimination can end, to where desegregation can end, where rights can be indeed more readily accessible to individuals. So we moved as a society during his time to where conditions were better. However, as I said, the here is not all that great. And he knew that though there were advancements, though there were victories, though there were things that happened in our society that let us know that there was more equality, in the 60s and than there was in the 50s and the 40s, he raised a question. Where do we go from here? Chaos or community? And in that book by its name, he outlined two different things, the here and the where. In the back of that book, there is an outline of a plan that he wanted to execute. But because of an assassin's bullet, he never got to execute. He never got to put into motion that plan. So the question is still a question that deserves an answer. 
It deserved one in 1968 and beyond, and it still deserves an answer today. It's a piercing question. Where? Where do we go from here? Chaos or community these days here involves too much violence in suburbs and in urban centers. Too much violence, senseless, too much economic uncertainty. Every day I read the newspaper and there's some story about how we are teetering on the edge. There was a report that was released the other day about the poverty that is in our state. Too much economic security. I was listening to the radio this morning and they were talking about the, how the defense would have to furlough some of its workers because of some fiscal stuff that Congress put into place. Now I say stuff because there's a whole lot of other ways to describe stuff. And if you follow the fiscal cliff and all of that, you know that there's a whole lot of stuff that happens in Congress that I can't describe other than as stuff. There's another word, but I don't think I want to use it in this context. I'll just re refrain from thinking about articulating that word, but stuff, stuff. makes me know that maybe we need something else, someone else, some new opportunity to help us deal with the economic conditions of our days. That leads me actually to the too much rancor in politics, because you know the rancor is connected to the stuff. The stridency, the, you know, on one side, on the right or on the left, and people lamenting that there was a time when Congress and people who were in political power were able to reason together and to come to what was best for the country rather than best for a political party. Stuff, rancor. Where do we go from here? Too many disparities in health. I'm involved in health advocacy some of the time. We read stories about the disparities that are there based on income, based on race, based on circumstance. Too many disparities to count. Too much chaos. And yes, not enough community. And when I talk about community, you know, the word is together in unity, but I don't really mean unity. I mean, I don't mean unanimity because, you know, just as I'm Baptist. So they say if you're Baptist and there are three people in a room, there are four opinions. <laughs> so I'm not looking for us to all think alike and to act alike and not necessarily to believe alike because it's an individual journey, but there ought to be a way that we can come together in community to answer the question and to put forward an agenda for this time that helps us to get to a better place than the here moment that we are currently in. You see, staying in that place of chaos, staying in that place where we were or are, there's no more an option in the days of Martin Luther King than in the days of Jesus. We must move from here so that people, folks that were of concern to Jesus and concern to his servant Martin could hear good news because mostly it's news or bad news. But the good news is not just about what is happening here and now, it's about the liberating word that comes through Jesus Christ that helps us to know that there is a hope beyond the circumstance in which we presently find ourselves, that there is a possibility that we can have joy in our hearts and rejoice in the Lord always. Good news. And in the Christian tradition, it is that Jesus Christ is Lord and that he has come to set his people free that he is living out that prophetic word in Isaiah that says this is the assignment that I have been given 
and you will be better off if you embrace the word that I have. He says, I will, you can do things more abundantly. And there's more to say about the mission of Jesus, but I want you to know that the good news is really good news. It's news about transformation, liberation, sanctification. It's good news. But it's not just that he wanted to give, the outcome was good news, that there would be some individuals who were blind who could see. And that sight is not just a physical sight. It's about spiritual insight. It's being able to see things and to see your way out of things. And to be released. That's another outcome. Not just a prison reform effort, as important as that is. It's about being released and able to serve to fulfill your calling in this time. Sight, insight, foresight, not hindsight. And to know freedom. Oh, freedom over me. Before I'd be a slave, I'd be buried in my grave and go home to my Lord and be free. The scripture says that the truth shall set us free. And we don't have to be held in bondage by things and stuff and circumstances. And the thing that I like the most, out of the five outcomes that Jesus included, that, that, that defined his ministry as recorded prophetically in Isaiah, to find healing. Doesn't mean that the circumstances or the pain would change necessarily. You know, sometimes when I think about those who are in Sandy Hook, I say to myself, the healing process has begun, but the healing process takes some time. It doesn't mean that the circumstance ever goes away or that the memory goes away. It's just that the sting is taken out of the circumstance. If you've ever had someone in your family or someone you know die, you know that, or if you've had someone who has hurt you in some way, what you know is you get to the place where you're no longer encumbered or held hostage by the pain of the situation. That what you are is liberated to understand how that prepares you to the next thing that you are to do or what you do redemptively out of that situation or how you bring healing to other individuals who have had similar circumstances. Christ came, Christ assumed his ministry to bring good news, to help people to receive sight, to be released from their captivity, to know freedom, and to find healing. Choosing community, my friends, makes this possible. Chaos will never do that. Choosing justice will make all of this possible. Chaos will not. Choosing safety physical safety, safety from harm on our streets will make this possible. Chaos, uh-uh, won't do that. Choosing peace, the peace that passes all understanding will make this possible. Chaos will not. The scripture says that God is not an author of confusion. I add that God is not an author of chaos. That God, what God wants is for us to walk together, children. Don't you get weary? Walk together, children. Don't you get weary? Walk together, children. Don't you get weary? There's a where, a great camp meeting in the promised land. We have, my friends, a responsibility to whom much is given, much is expected. We also have the opportunity, yes, it is the here and now moment in which we find ourselves, but every individual has an opportunity to live out the calling as Jesus and Martin King did. And even though you don't think you have anything to offer, you have the capability and the capacity. You may think that 
you are using every bit of energy and every bit of time and every bit of brain power at Yale that you have. But there's always more. There's always more. And if someone prayed a prayer and song that says, fill my cup, Lord. Let it overflow. There's always more that God calls us to do. God somehow or another helps us to increase our capability and capacity. I don't quite understand how that happens. Truth be told, you know, when I think about just as a personal matter and as an interjection, I told the group of students, public allies, a couple of weeks ago, I said, you know, when I was in my 20s, I was scared as all get out to stand before a group of people. Palmy, sweaty palms, knocked knees, racing heart. God increased my capacity so that I could not only stand here and speak this word, but I could stand here without notes and just ad lib. <laughs> now that may not be a good thing. But the point of it is, is that God somehow, as we move forward in embracing the call that God has put on our lives for the here, for this moment in time, something happens to us that allows for us to do more than what we thought we were able. What does the scripture say? Something about God can do more than we ask or imagine? You know, I mean, I don't know how God does that, but I just know from personal experience that God does that. And some days I just want to say, no, no more. Not one more thing. And then after I fuss, I say, okay. <laughs> it's good to get that out because, you know, you want to be a willing servant and an able servant and an available servant. You know, and personally, um, I, I would rather be in a relationship with God because God's been good to me than not to be in that relationship with God because I don't want God not to be good to me and to give strength and direction and purpose and meaning and mission. It's a good thing. It's better than ice cream or any of your favorite foods. That relationship is sweeter than the best pie that you or cake that you can think of. Mm. That re we have the responsibility, the capability, the opportunity, and the capacity within us to move from the here, this moment, to the where, so that the where becomes a better here. Because ultimately, as we move, as we do, as we work, as we serve, as we live out our calling in the here and now, something happens. A way is made out of no way. There's an opportunity that presents itself for us to do justice, to love mercy as we walk humbly with God. All we need is to be in that right place, to see the sign that leads to the same existential and prophetic place that Jesus and Martin Luther King saw and out of which they lived. That's a good place to be. So my prayer is that we would, all of us, each and every one of us, would see that sign sign that speaks to where we ought to be, where we ought to go, how we can move from the here to the where to make a better here. It's a question. The question is in the title of this sermon. It's a question I put in this sermon because it's a choice to whether or not you want to go from here to where. God knows. And if we follow, if we follow, we will know too. The sign that we seek, the sign that I seek, is not like the one at the mall. No. As helpful 
as it was for me to get to the store that I wanted to get to, as helpful as it was for me to get a sense of the physical space that I was in and how I would get from that sign to that store, the kind of sign that we receive from God directs us to the place where God wants us to be. From here to where? To the better here. Where he leads me, I will follow. Where he leads me, I will follow. Where he leads me, I will follow. I'll go with him, with him, all 